This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. Yes, this is a beautiful day. We welcome those of you who are with us, who are visiting today. I know that uh, Kyle, our new pastor, Kyle and Jen, have a lot of family and friends who came to be here with us today. And so we're so grateful that you're here with us. And if anyone else is visiting today, we're glad that you're here today too. This is a very special day for us here at Bethel Church. If you're online with us, welcome. You cannot smell what the rest of us are smelling here in this place if you're online. So too bad for you. You're going to miss a delicious meal uh, when this is all finished this morning. So um, today is a very special day because we get to celebrate the ordination and installation of our new pastor, Kyle Beckrick. Um, we have Pastor Cal with us here. Pat Cal Artsma is here with us to be a part of that installation service. And we also have with us this morning uh, Pastor Rankin Wilborn, who will be preaching Pastor Kyle's installation message. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him because most of us have never met him. I just met him this morning and have been communicating with him this week. And so here's, here's who he is. Rankin works on the staff of Relational Wisdom 360, which is a powerful ministry. If you go on their website, you'll see all kinds of wonderful resources. I went on there this week and resources for learning about the wisdom of God and how to live our lives truly as Christians. Christian followers of Christ. He has been a pastor for over two decades, serving in a variety of contexts, including as a lead pastor in Los Angeles, California, and an assistant pastor in the Northeast, South, and most recently in the Midwest. Before becoming a pastor, he worked in corporate banking for several years. He's written two award-winning books and is keenly interested in emotional health, wholehearted discipleship, and building bridges from the Bible to our modern concerns. He loves sports, including coaching his three children's teams, and he's married to Morgan, and their family reside on a farm in Evansville. Rankin has served as a mentor and a friend to Kyle during his college ministry and also during his seminary journey. So we welcome him here with us this morning, and we're excited to have him here. And I know Kyle is very excited to have him uh, hear his message this morning, too. So as you've been uh, smelling as you came into this room this morning, into this place, uh, we are going to have a luncheon after this service this morning, and you are all invited. There was no sign-up for this, so if you didn't sign up, don't worry and think you cannot come. Everybody is welcome to come to the lunch, and as you can tell, it's going to be delicious, okay? Um, so uh, there was, again, when the service is over, what we would like you to do is just stay in your seats, okay? At the end of the service, we'll receive a blessing, and then you can just sit back down and stay in your seats. If you cannot stay for the luncheon, at that point, you're welcome to go out, grab some coffee, grab some cookies, whatever you want to do. But if you're staying for the luncheon, we'd, we'd like you to just stay in this room, and then we'll dismiss you in an orderly fashion to get your food and find some seats um, for the luncheon. So that's what we'll do at the end of the service. Hopefully, you'll remember all of that by the time we get there. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention, too, that tomorrow evening is our women's ministry. Um, Beloved are having a gathering tomorrow night, and we're going to have a night of worship and an ice cream social. So if any of the women can come to that, that would be awesome. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, come and enjoy some wonderful worship tomorrow night at our Beloved gathering. So those are all the announcements that I have to give you this morning. Let's take a moment right now to just stand and welcome each other to this amazing place this morning in this amazing service. So greet those around you. Huh? 
Our God is loving and forgiving God. His mercies are new every morning. Please listen to these words from Micah 7. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. Who does not retain his anger forever? Because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show forgiveness and faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Indeed, there is no God like our God. Let's praise him together.
Let's pray together. Loving, forgiving, and merciful God, we praise you today for your amazing compassion. We don't deserve this kind of love. We've disappointed you over and over again with our constant sinning, yet you choose to love us anyway. May our praises today express to you how grateful we are and how much we love you in return. May our lives be an expression of the joy in our hearts that overflows because of the abundant love you give in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray in his precious name. Amen. If you are able, you are invited to stand as we continue to worship. Please join me in our morning prayers together. 
Lord, our voices have cried out words of praise to you, Jesus, our marvelous, wonderful Savior. We are amazed at the depth of your work for our salvation and how undeserving we are. And so we praise you and worship you as Savior. But today, in a very special way, we also come and kneel before you as the Lord of the church. And so we pray for this congregation, Bethel Christian Reformed Church. We pray for the denomination, the Christian Reformed Church. We pray for the church universal today. Blessed Savior, we acknowledge you as Lord of the church. You are the head of the church. And so today, Father, in a very special way, we pray that you'll lead us and guide us, that you'll grant us a clear sense of your vision, purpose, and calling, and that then you will empower us to live out that calling in all the things that we do and say as a congregation and as individuals. We pray for the new council. We pray for our new pastor. We pray your blessing and guidance and equipping upon them as they come alongside us to work out your purposes in ministry. Lord, we pray for the Christian Reformed Church as the Synod meets during this time. Root it deeply in your word, guided by your spirit. May it stand strong in truth. May it speak in a powerful way, in a life-changing way, as it comes together for purposes for your kingdom and for your glory. And so guide the synod today. Lord, we also acknowledge you as the head of the body. You've granted gifts to the church. We celebrate those gifts in leadership, but we also acknowledge that each and every one of us are uniquely equipped and gift. And so, Father, we pray that we will not hide our gifts Deprive the church of your gifts. Steal from the kingdom the gifts that you have entrusted to us. May we truly use these gifts and that you'll bless the ministries that we commit ourselves to. May, Lord, this congregation be a place that truly worships you, that stands strong in your word, that disciples and raises up people, whether we're talking about your blessing and ministry in the lives of our little ones from childhood on, throughout the course of our entire lives. We pray, Lord, that you unite our hearts in love and in fellowship. That, Lord, you'll give us a clear sense of your vision for your lost world and empower us in our witness and in our service. Lord, as head of the church, head of the body, we also acknowledge that the church is your precious bride. Help us to cherish the church. Help us, Lord, to, to truly live out what it means to be your beloved bride. May we fall more deeply in love to you every day. But Lord, we also acknowledge that all too often, as your bride, our garments are spotted and stained. So we come again today seeking your forgiveness, your cleansing, and your empowerment to live for you, even as we sung this morning that you are indeed our Savior. Lord, as the church is your precious body, we also pray for those who have special needs. We pray for the sick. In a special way today, Lord, we lift up before you Sally and John, Becky and Nora, uh, Nora and Jim. Lord, we pray that you will heal and restore. Lord, we lay before you those who carry heavy burdens, who struggle with various issues in their lives. Liberate them through your Spirit's power and through Christ's redeeming work. Father, we also pray for those who grieve. Be their comfort and their hope and their peace as you keep before them the vision of your resurrection life. And Lord, as a church, we also acknowledge that we are called to mission. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll use Bethel and use us as workhorses for the sake of your kingdom. In that regard, we pray for your broken world. We think of the ongoing conflicts around the world we pray, Father, for, for the ongoing war in Ukraine. We pray for the violence in our streets. Lord, we, we pray for this broken world, that your shalom, your peace, your kingdom will come in power and in healing and in life and restoration. And Lord, we also pray that you will be with the church in mission as it goes out. Equip us in our lives a witness. Equip Bethel in its witness. And Lord, we pray for the mission power as it goes out universally today in all the various forms, through pulpits, through radio, through television, through various forms of media and internet. 
May your gospel will go forward and may lives be touched for the sake of your kingdom. In that regard, we also pray for the Eliana mission team. Grant them safety and fruit upon their labor. And Lord, we continue to hold up all of the missionaries of this congregation, but in a very special way, we lift up before you the Vanderdykes. Bless their ministry and bring fruit upon their labor as they offer themselves in service to you, the head of the church. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. This time, the deacons will come forward to receive our offering. The first offering is for Providence Life Ministries. The second one is for Highland Christian School. You can give as the plates pass around before you, or you can go online and give through our website, discoverbethel.org slash donate, or you can drop uh, your gifts and tithes in the uh, mail or drop them by the office. It's an opportunity for us to express our gratitude to God our obedience to God, but also our trust in Him and His provision. And so let's give generously as God has blessed us today. As we worship God with our giving this morning, we're going to continue to worship Him also with a song, a song called Praise the Savior. Uh, this is a song, a new song. Today is a, a, a new song for our congregation. Some of you might know it already. Pastor Kyle knows it, and he asked if we could sing it as part of his service this morning. So we're going to learn this song together over the next few weeks. And uh, it's a song that talks about our sin and the trouble that that is in our lives and that Jesus himself has an answer for all of that. So listen as we sing these words to his answer to our sin, and we can do nothing but praise him because of who he is.
That was beautiful. Let me pray for us. Almighty God, our Father, let the gospel come now, not in word only, but in power. In the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction, pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's a great honor uh, to be with you today. My name is Rankin, friend of Kyle's and Jen's. I want to start with uh, a thought from Doris Kearns Goodwin, if you know that name. She's one of our best uh, historians and biographers. Uh, Her book on Lincoln, Team of Rivals, has become required reading, not only for fans of that president, but for anyone thinking about leadership today. At the end of her writing life, Goodwin set out to distill what she'd learned from decades of studying America's greatest leaders, and here's what she wrote. Scholars who've studied the development of leaders have situated resilience, the ability to sustain ambition in the face of frustration at the heart of potential leadership growth. More important than what happened to them was how they responded to these challenges and how these experiences at first impeded, then deepened, and finally molded their leadership. You've hired a very gifted young pastor in Kyle Beckrick. He has become a dear friend and a man for whom I have a great affection. And Kyle, where are you? (laughs) There you are. I'm so excited for you, buddy. And uh, this community is going to love you. I'm so excited for you. And I'm so excited for you, Bethel, uh, because I know you're going to love this man. You're going to love his family. Uh, And after all you've been through, uh, this is a new day. And God is going to do amazing things in your midst. Kyle, this is just a a unique day, so I just want to ask you to do something strange. I just, bear with me, but I want you to stand up, and I want you to turn around, and I want you to look at these faces that you're going to be preaching to every week. (laughs) And I want you just to imagine all the stories in this room. Every face is a story. You know, I once heard a pastor say that if we had x-ray eyes and we could see into the hearts of the people to whom we're addressing, we would just burst into tears at the pain, at the things that you carry. And Kyle, the, the privilege, the responsibility you've been given to be a pastor to these dear souls But that's really the question, isn't it? Will Kyle become a good leader? If I could uh, dare to adapt Doris Kern Goodwin, uh, she says the answer will have everything to do with how you navigate the heartaches and disappointments that are sure to come here. But if I could adapt what she says to the unique challenges of pastoral leadership, I'd like to add the answer will not only depend on how you navigate the stress that is sure to come your way, but also it will depend on whether this crucible will move you, will move you, Kyle, for what will feel like the first time in your life to believe that the gospel is true for you, too, the one who preaches. (laughs) When you are pressed not to turn inward to your own considerable gifts, but to learn what it means to turn outward and say with the psalmist, the Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation, David says. 
Kyle, will you finally learn what it means to rest in Christ alone as He's offered in the gospel? Now, this may sound like to all of you a strange prayer, (laughs) that in leading others to Christ, that Kyle might finally come to believe the gospel that he himself preaches. But that is the biblical pattern. You have to go through the wilderness to the new land. You have to experience suffering, even death, to a new life. Finding life through losing your own, our Lord says. But what does that look like for a pastor? Well, Kyle, it means that someday, in the future, someday your ministry, your ministry is going to have to be crucified. Your ministry. Because here's the thing, it's not a given. I mean, you would think that pastors whose days are filled with studying the Bible and telling others about Christ, that we would be closer to God's heart. But nothing lends itself to hypocrisy. Nothing lends itself to cutting off your heart from your head, like constantly telling others about a reality that you yourself are not presently experiencing. I mean, if you were talking week after week about these massive realities like grace, and you're not living in that and operating out of it? When it's your job to talk about the goodness of God in every season, even in seasons where you may not be feeling that yourself, well, Kyle, it's easy to get familiar with just playing a role. And it's an important role, and it can be a rewarding role. But I'm here to tell you, if you're not paying attention something can happen to your soul. Spiritual malformation is an occupational hazard for preachers. And you know what you can end up with? You can end up with a theology that's like a snowflake, intricate, beautiful, and frozen. Kyle, in many ways, you're like my little brother. So I'm I'm doing today what a good big brother should. I'm telling you the things that I wish I had known when I was in your your shoes so you can avoid the mistakes that I made and be a better pastor than your big brother. Because, I, man, I, driving in, I remember that being a senior pastor for the first time. And, I, you know, like you, you're greeting everyone in the hall. I remember saying all the right things. But I'll tell you, inwardly, I was terrified. I was terrified, desperately wanting to prove myself, wondering if I had what it takes, wanting so much to be liked, wanting to be used by God, of course, but also wanting to be a success and not altogether honest with myself about what that would really look like. I had the common anxieties that all pastors feel, wondering if the church would grow, riding the roller coaster of weekly attendance, petrified the church would shrink, or what can be even harder, stagnate, not make budget. But that's not the concern I have for you, Kyle. It's not that things won't go well. It's not that Bethel will flounder under you, but that it will flourish beyond your wildest imagining, that this place will be filled multiple services. Now, most pastors hearing me will say, I'll take that trial. Sign me up for that, not realizing our greatest tests in life come not in adversity but in prosperity. It's been said that while many Christians may pass the test of adversity, 99% fail the test of prosperity. There's a proverb, Proverb 27, verse 21, as the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold, so a person is tested by the praise he receives. That is, how a person handles success and the praise it can bring can expose our heart like nothing else. And as we'll see in just a moment, the Bible shows us one of the most dangerous things that can happen to a person is to experience great success before you've been deeply broken. Kyle, we have a lot in common. Pretty good athletes. If any of you play golf, invite Kyle. 
He loves it. He's competitive. We're hustlers, driven by some things we're not altogether aware of. But I also know, little brother, that if performing to win approval is a pattern in your life, as it was for me, then success and achievement, those can become addictions, real addictions, as they did for me. And I would spare you of that. So to bring this back to Doris Kern Goodwin's insight on what makes the leader, how are you going to respond when the trials of ministry, be they the trials of adversity or the trials of success, when those bring you in touch with your dark side? Because make no mistake, Kyle, you have a dark side, as every leader, as every person does. What are you going to do? You can deny that dark side, and that's what a lot of pastors do because it's terrifying. It's threatening. It's ugly. So you can push down those distressing emotions and play a role. You can cover over your weaknesses, say all the right words, stay very busy, or, and that's really the question, is there any medicine you can apply to your heart in the beginning? to heal your ambition so your drive doesn't harm your soul or hurt these dear people. Well, I don't think there's any story in the Bible for navigating that question better than the story of the man the great literary critic Northrop Fry once called the one great tragic hero of the Bible. Aristotle said a tragic hero is a person whose story evokes our pity and fear because in him we see writ large possibilities that lie within each of us. And you know who that uh, character is? It's King Saul. So if you have a Bible, you can flip it open to 1 Samuel. I'm just going to be walking through the story of King Saul. If you think you know Saul, think again. He's a complex man. We're introduced to him in 1 Samuel chapter 9 where we're told that Saul was an impressive young man without equal. 1 Samuel 9 verse 2 says, He was a handsome young man, as handsome as could be found anywhere in Israel. Uh, Here's where he's not like you, Kyle. It says he's a head taller than all the rest. (laughs) He literally stood head and shoulders above the crowd. And at first he appears to be humble, not at all ambitious. I mean, he just can't believe someone from his tribe could be so honored. It's chapter 9, verse 21. Am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans? This text makes, the text makes clear that Saul is touched by God. He's a changed man. He does not start off seeking honor for himself. In one of the great lines in all the Bible, when the prophet Samuel comes to name him king, Saul is nowhere to be found. And 1 Samuel 10, verse 22 says, quote, he has hidden himself among the baggage. I just love that line because we know Saul's this huge guy, and it must have looked so humorous just trying to hide himself. But the point is clear. Saul did not seek honor for himself. He feels unworthy, as I'm sure you do, Kyle. And we forget that as a king, as a military tactician, Saul was very successful, and he was brave and justice-minded. I mean, people ask today, why can't the very best among us run for public office? Well, that was Saul. (laughs) In fact, the Bible calls him, this is chapter 10, verse 24, the best. No one like him in the whole country. Okay? Okay? This is a good man, and yet over the course of his life, something happens to Saul. And at first, the cracks in his character, they're they're almost indetectable. The prophet Samuel tells him, this is later in chapter 10, "'Go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and I will surely come down to you to sacrifice. But you must wait seven days until I come to you.'" It's chapter 10, verse 8. If you flip forward a few chapters, the Bible reads, And he waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. That's chapter 13, verse 8. 
So what does Saul do? He makes the offering himself, and just as he's finished, Samuel arrives and says, what have you done? And Saul, his excuse sounds so reasonable. He says that when he saw that their enemies were gathered, the Philistines were gathering for war, and that his men were scattering, and that he had not yet sought the Lord's favor, he said he felt compelled to go on ahead. I think most readers would say, Samuel was late. Saul was performing an act of worship. I mean, compared to the mistakes that other leaders make in the Bible, <laughs> deception, adultery, murder, this doesn't seem all that bad. It's confusing. And yet we're given a clue, something is amiss, when Saul is told by Samuel that the Lord will, quote, seek out a man after his own heart. It's our first glimpse of David and our first sign that something is amiss where only God can see in Saul's heart. We sense that his success has begun to corrupt him. And then comes the text where I want to focus our attention today, 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, Saul is told to conquer the Amalekites, a notoriously wicked people. And he's told to destroy their village and everything in it, including the animals. Now, Kyle, I'm doing a couple of things today I don't want you to emulate. First, I'm not preaching through a specific text. I've told Kyle that, among other things, I hope, if you're not already, that Bethel will be known in this community as a church which teaches the Bible unapologetically, boldly, and carefully every week. But today I'm not preaching through a text. I'm just asking from Saul's life, what happened to this great man? Second, I'm bypassing a huge question that any thoughtful non-Christian here would ask, or I'd, I'd say any conscientious Christian would ask, and, and that's what's the deal with war in the Old Testament? I mean, this text invites some huge questions that a conscientious pastor needs to address if Bethel is going to be a place where skeptics and non-Christians are welcomed and treated respectfully, which I hope you always will be. But Kyle, I'm going to leave that question to you to handle at some point, <laughs> at some later date. But on to chapter 15. Saul was told to sacrifice the Lord, even the animals, the sheep and the cattle. Verse 9 reads, Saul and the army spared the best of the sheep and the cattle, everything that was good. And let's pick up the story in verse 12. And Samuel, that's the prophet, rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul has came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. Now, if you've been reading the story, you're supposed to pause, you're supposed to, wait, what? He set up a monument to himself. Keep reading, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, blessed be, you to, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people, the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we've devoted to destruction. You see what he's doing? He's not accepting responsibility. It wasn't me. It was the people shifting responsibility. Already beginning to defend himself. Verse 16, then Samuel said to Saul, stop. And I will tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, and put a star next to verse 17. Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord. Please make a note that the Hebrew word obey is the same as the Hebrew word for hear. To hear and to obey in the Hebrew mind, that's the same thing. If you don't do it, you didn't hear it. 
Verse 20, and and Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me. You see, he's still defending himself, still defending himself. Verse 21, but the people, the people took of the spoil, a sheep in the auction, the best of the things devoted for destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And attentive readers will know these will go on to be some of the most quoted words in all the Bible, repeated in the Old and New Testaments, emphasizing that God cares more about the motives of our heart. God cares more about our motives, which are often unknown to us, God cares more about our motives than our religious words or our religious actions. Verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words because I feared the people. Now, I singled this verse out because one of our tendencies today in our culture wars is we like to divide people uh, between good and bad, us and them. But there is no them. (laughs) See, Saul is a complex person, which is to say Saul is a human being. He has sorrow. He has regrets. And to my ear, he shows more self-awareness than most leaders when he says, quote, I did not obey because I feared the people. I mean, that's why he couldn't hear the Lord's voice because he was listening too much He cared too much about the judgments of the people he'd been called to lead. He'd come to need their approval too much. Verse 27, and as Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Now, that was a cut. It was intended to cut. I mean, for someone whose whole life had been seen as better than or more impressive than, to be told, the Lord will give what is most important to you to someone who is, quote, better than you. And if you keep reading Saul's story, you'll discover the sin which ends up crippling Saul's life is envy. Envy. Envy runs on comparison. Envy asks, what about me? Envy is unable to enjoy in gratitude what you've already been given because all you can focus on is what you lack. And this, too, is an occupational hazard of pastors, professional jealousy. We remember Saul returning from military victory, hearing the crowd singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And for pastors, that looks like, now how big is your church? As Saul gives in to needing the approval of the people he's been called to lead, he's eventually given over. He's given over to it. And his story shows us that like any addiction, the more in the beginning you give in, the more you put yourself in touch with forces that enslave you beyond your control. I mean, what has happened to this man? He's gone from hiding himself among the baggage to a power-obsessed tyrant. I mean, this is one of the few stories in the Bible that ends in suicide. 1 Samuel 31, verse 4, Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. Now, you may think, what does this have to do with us? But that's why Saul is a tragic hero, because we see in him, writ large, possibilities that lie within each one of us. Because this is the kind of story at first, admit it, that we love. A country boy from a small town, plucked from obscurity, who goes on to great success. We're given a sign that his heart is drifting when we're told he set up a monument for his own honor. And we read that and we think, I mean, who would do that? Who would broadcast publicly on a platform anyone could see, accomplishments that bring honor to yourself. I mean, who would do that? 
Isn't that a lot of our social media? <laughs> I mean, one reason that drinking in the admiration of others is so intoxicating to all of our hearts is because it touches on a desire that we all have. Everyone in this room, we were created to be seen and to be loved. I like how the neuroscientist Kurt Thompson put it, we all come into the world looking for a face that's looking for us. We all want to be seen. We all want to be loved. But that perfectly natural desire easily gets corrupted into settling for a counterfeit, a substitute, what the Bible calls trying to win the approval of human beings. And Kyle, could anything come more naturally to a new pastor than that temptation, than trying to win the approval of these dear people? That's why, to my ear, the key line of the story is 1 Samuel 15, verse 17, if you'll look again at that verse with me. Samuel said to Saul, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king and sent you on a mission. Why then did you not obey? You hear what he's saying? Saul, remember where you came from. A farm boy from the tribe of Benjamin, you used to be small. But God anointed you and appointed you and gave you a mission. You used to be small, but God made you great. So then why are you now so worried about how you look to others to the point that you'd erect a monument to yourself? If you read verse 17 in different translations, it captures an important nuance. Some translations say, though you are little in your own eyes, present tense, though you are little, that is, though you feel insignificant, have you not been called to a position of great honor? But other translations say, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become head of the tribes of Israel? Saul went from being genuinely shocked overwhelmed with surprise of God's choice of him, to feeling entitled, to needing the applause of others, to the point that you remember later in the story, he becomes murderously envious of David. Why? Because David threatens that in which Saul has come to place his confidence, his trust, his identity, his reason for living. Saul's self-worth has become wrapped up in his calling is leading God's people. His self-worth got wrapped up in his calling of leading God's people. I mean, who would do that? <laughs> this temptation, Kyle, to forget who we were, who we are, where we came from, what the Lord has done for us, this temptation to think that we need to prove ourselves and validate ourselves by the affirmations of others, that's not just Saul's story. That's my story. And that's why I picked this text for you, little brother. And we can all see how this story might intersect with Kyle, just a small town boy from Roselawn, Indiana, pride of Newton County, incredibly gifted, admirable, impressive, great wife great kids, called to be your senior pastor. And Kyle, when the stress comes, you too will be tempted to run on your own considerable gift package. You will. And you will become susceptible to drinking in the praise of others. You will. Saul's story warns us to the, to the degree that we are small in our own eyes, which I'll tell you a little secret, most of us pastors are. To the degree we are small in our own eyes, that which you most want to see here, evident prosperity, God's hand moving upon you, that might just feed the monster. Just a small town boy with something to prove, wondering if you've got what it takes. Desperately wanting someone to say, you did it, son, I'm proud of you. And I don't care how old you are, there's not a man in this room. I've never met a man 
who wasn't yearning to hear that from his father. You did it, son. Proud of you. But Saul's story is not just for insecure pastors. For all of us in this room, this story asks, where are you looking to satisfy your core needs, to be seen, to be secure, to be significant? If you're not resting in the steadfast love of God, your heavenly Father, a love that is independent of what you do, or have done, or failed to do. That's why it's steadfast. If you're not living for the applause of heaven that have already been secured for you in Jesus Christ, if the Lord's verdict in Jesus of forgiven and accepted, if being called by His name is not the monument you set up in your heart is what matters most to you, if this is not your deepest consolation and your most satisfying honor, then whatever gains you experience, all they're going to do is lead you away from the only ground where you will ever find rest. There is no loophole. I've looked for it. But you can't escape it. You can't have your cake and eat it too. It can't be, yes, Jesus, and what I really want. Until you've learned to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. And that's true day one, Kyle. But you're going to have to live your way into believing that. And God may mercifully break your stride mid-course, as the psalmist says, for you to, for you to learn that all your running was never going to lead you home. The gospel tells all of us that Saul's story is, in a very real sense, all of our stories, because only the gospel makes sense of one of the great mysteries of human experience. We all feel this tension in our lives, this simultaneous collision of our sense of insignificance, our sense of insignificance, our insecurity, alongside this hidden desire to be significant, to make a difference. Both of those things are true. The great mathematician, Blaise Pascal, he wrote about this, how the gospel holds this together, this mystery. It helps us understand why we are small in our own eyes. It tells us no matter what we achieve, we cannot escape that inner insecurity. The gospel humbles us like nothing else. It tells us we feel this way because we are frail and limited and broken, and yes, sinners. The gospel tells us that when we know ourselves, we know no one can say anything about us that is too bad. Because even if it's not true what they're saying, we can instead remember what they don't know about us that is true that's worse. Now, that's the kind of thing pastors often say, but we don't believe. But if, Kyle, if you internalize that, if you internalize that, no one, that no one can say anything about you that's too bad that you're the chief of sinners, if you, if you internalize that, you no longer need to defend yourself. You don't have to worry about the opinions of others. As one of my mentors said to me, what you think of me is no business of mine, but what I think of what you think of me, now that can kill me. He's talking about humility, and that's medicine, Kyle, that you can start applying to your heart day one. It looks like releasing results to the Lord. It looks like releasing the opinions, having a very low opinion of these dear people's opinion of you, having a very low opinion of that, and caring most about the Lord's opinion. That's what the crucifixion of your ministry is going to look like. On the other hand, Kyle, the gospel not only humbles us to the ground, it lifts us up like it did to Saul and promotes us to a position of honor that no work of our hand could ever garner for us. Like Saul, we too have been promoted in status against all expectation. And like Saul, it had nothing to do with our deserving it. We can't believe it. We're constantly surprised by it. 
That as he did with Saul, the Lord chose us and anointed us and set us apart and sent us on a mission. And don't you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's what it means for you to be a follower of our Lord. That he has called you by name, set you apart, given you a position of honor, sent you on a mission. Kyle, this is day one of your being the senior pastor of Bethel. This is the beginning of your public ministry. Do you remember at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, before he'd accomplished or said or done anything, in a public ceremony, Jesus saw the heavens torn open, ripped apart, and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son. You are my beloved Son. With you, with you I am well pleased. Now, you know that story, but have you ever stopped to ask, didn't Jesus already know that? Was not God his Father? Had they not spent eternity together, delighting in one another, as Jesus will say in John 17? So what is this? This is experiential language. Jesus saw the heavens open, and he heard a voice from heaven. And then he's immediately driven by that same Spirit into the wilderness for a trial. Now, Kyle, if the Lord Jesus Himself had need of this public affirmation, these words spoken over His life, in the beginning of His public ministry, before He'd done anything, if the Son of God had need to be prepared for His calling in this way, how much more do you and I, day one, before you have done or said anything here and to prepare you for the wilderness that will someday come. As if to say, to splice these stories together, Kyle, though you are small in your own eyes, I know you're scared. Though you're small in your own eyes, you are the beloved son in whom the father is well pleased no matter what happens here at Bethel. And you move out and lead these people in that confidence and in that courage. You know who wants you to hear that, Kyle? You know who wants you to believe that? The one in whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. I think he, the Lord Jesus, would want me to tell you that. You know that that's what we all need to hear every Sunday the gospel of grace. More than three points or four keys or five steps, Kyle, we need to hear the gospel every Sunday because it leaks out of our hearts every week. That's what non-Christians here need to hear every week, the gospel of the Lord Jesus' grace for you that is independent of what you've done, that is not about your deserving, that it is all about his heart. That's what non-Christians need to hear, but that's also what Christians need to hear. The gospel is not only how you begin the Christian life, it's how you grow in the Christian life. So you keep hearing it over and over and over. You know the same word used here of the heavens being torn open at Jesus' baptism would later be used of the curtain in the temple at the moment of Jesus' death, to say that by his death, torn open, making a way, given, given access by his own death to people like Saul and me, Kyle, please get us to the cross every Sunday. Get us to the completed, finished work of Christ. Remind us who we are who we were, and what God has done for us in Christ. And Kyle, that is a medicine you can apply to your own heart to start healing your own ambition. And I'll tell you something my wife told me a few years ago that I've never forgotten. She said, Rankin, there are very few problems you face that humility won't solve. That's always the way forward. And I'll say to you, dear church, Kyle is a good man. He's, he's a good guy. But Saul's story reminds us that even the best man is a man at best. Kyle will disappoint you. 
In fact, he was joking with me in the hall. He's like, I'll probably never be more popular than I am today because next week I have to start preaching. <laughs> he will have his quirks. He will make mistakes, and some of them not small. There are a lot of expectations on a new pastor, and most of them are unspoken. And there is always a temptation to put a pastor on a pedestal. You say, oh, no, not us, not after what we've been through, but especially after what you've been through. But take it from me, the higher the pedestal, the greater the disappointment when your pastor lets you down and falls off. So what I'm asking you, I'm asking you to give this man permission to be a human being. Give yourself that permission as well. And Kyle, I'm asking you to lead these dear people by being the chief repenter at Bethel. That when you don't know what to do, you can know humility and repentance. That is always the way forward. Well, we began by saying, maybe someday you'll finally be able to rest in the gospel that you preach to others. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Maybe when people ask you, Kyle, how can we pray for you? You know what you can say? You might want to learn to say and mean, would you pray that I would believe the gospel? <laughs> I mean, when the senior pastor says that, you know what you'll be doing? You'll be leading with your weaknesses, which in the end, I'll tell you a little secret, is what people here can relate to. They can't relate to your strengths. They need to see your weaknesses. Get a counselor. Talk openly about how important emotional health is, how much your past and your childhood affects your present. As Pete Scazzaro put it, Jesus may be in your heart, but Grandpa's in your bones. Kyle, let them see that you need the gospel that you preach as much as anyone listening. And let them feel not just how much you want them to believe it, but how much you yourself need this to be true, the gospel you're preaching to others. And Kyle, my friend, let Saul's story caution you that if a man this impressive, if he could drift, how imperative it will be for you to get your own heart to the cross so that you will become a gentle gentle man, a compassionate man. That means, Kyle, make caring for your soul a daily priority, like medicine that you never miss taking. That private soul work that no one here can see, that's not preparing you for the more important work. That is the more important work. And I'll tell you, for a hustler, that takes a lot of training to learn how to slow down a slow-down spirituality, to learn how to pray. That's right, as a senior pastor, you learn how to pray. Learn how to build what Ruth Haley Barton calls sacred rhythms. I'm not asking you to try harder. I am asking you to train and learn how important that training is. And above, above all, little brother, I have this to say to you. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples, he said, fear not, little flock. Fear not. Some translations say, fear not, little children. <laughs> you remember that? Fear not, little children. And I want to say to you, Kyle, fear not, little brother. Because I know it's scary. But here's a word for all of us who do feel small in our own eyes. You know what? There is one with x-ray eyes who can see, he can see your pain, your stories, and the things you carry. And he speaks over your life, Kyle, and he speaks over all of your lives. And you know what he says? He says, I see you. You are my beloved child with whom I'm well pleased. You are safe. You are secure. You are significant. Whew. 
That's the gospel. Now go live in it. Let me preach. Let me pray for all of us. Lord, thank you for this uh, privilege to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. Lord, to declare the truth that is greater than our understanding of it. That your steadfast love endures forever. That as we heard earlier, as, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. Lord, all of us in this room, we pray for Kyle and we pray for Jen. And Lord, we pray that Kyle would have what even our Lord Jesus had at the beginning of his ministry, a depth encounter, a sense on the heart that he is chosen and beloved, well pleased before he has done anything for your people here, Lord so that he will then be set free to care for us without needing our approval. Lord, give him the courage of a lion, the tenderness of a lamb. We pray in the name of the lion and the lamb, even our Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask Kyle Ardsma to come forward, and Kyle, if you'll come forward. We're almost done, but Cal is, uh, Cal is going to lead us through a, a short uh, service of installation. It truly is a glorious and special day. Thank you for challenging us, not just challenging Kyle, but each and every one of us in our lives before the Lord. So may God truly bless those words to our hearts as we seek to live them. Scripture teaches us that God has given gifts to the church, that it may grow in faith, in love, in service, and in witness. And today we celebrate and recognize one of the great and precious gifts that God has given to us through his love. It is our privilege for the ordination and installation of Kyle to be the commissioned pastor here at Bethel Christian Reformed Church. Kyle, I just have a few questions for you. Do you promise to set Jesus apart in your heart as your first love, and will you strive as a way of life to return to your first love and a lifestyle of repentance and faith? Do you? I do. God help me. And do you promise that your wife and children will not be casualties of your ministry? and that you will endeavor to keep them feeling as though they are priorities in your life. Do you? I do, God helping me. Do you promise to love the people of Bethel, the bride of Christ, to love them sacrificially, to show wisdom in protecting the peace and purity of the church, always striving eagerly to maintain unity in the bond of peace, whatever may whatever opposition may arise to you on that account, do you? I do, God helping me. And have you been called, as far as you know your own heart, to seek this office from a sincere love of God and a desire to promote His glory in the gospel of His Son? Yes. Will you strive to build trust among the people here by exercising care, listening to them, listening to their stories? Do you? I do, God helping me. And will you strive by the grace of God to adorn the gospel by your way of life, publicly and privately, and all you do and say, so you will be known as this church's chief repenter? Do you? I will, God helping me. And are you now willing to undertake this calling with a due sense of insufficiency, relying upon God to give you strength and wisdom? Yes. Cal. Congregation, I invite you to join me in this responsive reading. Ephesians 4 teaches us that to each one of us a grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. 
It is he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. So the body of Christ be built up till we reach unity in the faith, knowledge the Son of God, become mature, and the whole fullness of Christ. Congregation of Christ, please stand if you are able and answer the following questions. Do you, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, welcome this world as your pastor? Do you promise to receive the word of God proclaimed by him and to encourage him in the discharge of all of his duties? Will you pray that he, in the power of the Holy Spirit, equip you to build up the church so that God's children might be saved and his kingdom might be advanced for the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? People of God, what is your answer? We do. God helping us. I want to just stop for a moment and challenge and charge you. Those words that you spoke were not just promises to Kyle. They certainly were that. They were pledges that you spoke in the presence of one another. Hold each other accountable to that. But most importantly, those were vows you spoke before the Lord. Therefore, I want to challenge you to receive Kyle as a precious gift from God to you. Love him. Respect him. Encourage him. But not only him, but also his family. As a pastor, we understand the importance of that. Love his family and encourage him. One of the best gifts that a church gave me is when I moved away from the Midwest, away from family, moved to a congregation in Oregon, and two people, no longer kids of their own that lived in the area, adopted our kids, and they became grandparents. They took that seriously. That was their pledge to us day one, and I didn't realize how deep it ran until we had a birthday party and didn't invite them. <laughs> we invited them from that point forward. <laughs> love, respect, and encourage. I also want to challenge you to remember the words that we shared together just a few weeks ago. From Ephesians, you read them earlier in that responsive reading, reminding us that Christ is the head of the church and we commit ourselves fully to his purposes, his leading, his kingdom, his glory, his work. But he does it, yes, through gifted leaders, but also through each and every one of us. Gifts as Christ apportioned it to each and every one of us. It is tempting after a couple of hard, hard years to step back and say, whew, we got our pastor. I can breathe. I can relax. I can step back. My answer to you is no. This is Christ's church. He gifted you for the work of of mission and ministry. Don't step back, but in a bigger way, a greater way, in a shared vision that God has laid upon this congregation in Kyle's heart, move forward for the glory of God and for the building up of his kingdom. With that, Kyle, I invite you to take a, a middle step here, and I want to call forward all pastors, all council members, including former council members, to come forward for the laying on of the hands. Please join me in a prayer. Lord, we come to you and thank you for the gift that you have given to us. Lord, we pray for your empowerment. 
As Elisha sought a double portion of your Spirit's power, Lord, we pray for a double portion to be on Kyle. Bless him, empower him, lead him, equip him. Work in him, work through him for the glory of your name and for the building up of your people. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon this congregation. May we truly live out those words we spoke, that we too commit ourselves to your purpose and calling, and that we will come together with words of encouragement and love, with hands willing for service, with mouths to speak your truth as you move in and through this congregation for the glory of your name. So Lord, we pray for Kyle. We pray for his family. We pray for this congregation. May truly, through all of these things, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Kyle, receive these words of God. God's promise, God's blessing, God's equipping from Hebrews. And now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may take your seats. Oh.
going to miss our times at Panera, Kyle, but I'm so happy for you, this wonderful calling, and this benediction. Next week, you're going to be giving this, but Kyle, this is not just for you. This is for everyone here. Look up and receive the Lord's benediction means good word, and it's a good word spoken over your lives. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and give you peace. The Lord lift up the light of your countenance, both now and forevermore. Amen.